Coach Brother Peter with tidbits from the Word. The question, big question for today is, does anybody know how to worship God? Well, I can tell you how. There's only one way to worship God, and that's through learning and knowing, reading His written Word. He left us written Word. Back in the Old Testament days, He spoke audibly to people. And he spoke through prophets, and he spoke through different people. Uh, my study right now is David. David, when the Bible said he was a man after God's own heart. And because God allowed David to have some downfalls in his life, some places where he absolutely 100% looked like he was the devil's servant, and yet he was God's servant. We've all had those places in our lives since we've been saved. And, but God forgives us. And do you know when God forgives us, he does away completely with sin. He doesn't remember it anymore. He doesn't write it down in a book that he can open up one day and say to you, you remember that sin right there, Pete? 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 No, he doesn't do that. He opens up the book, and the book is clean from a sin or whatever. But he does have this. You went down to the station and passed out tracks at 3 o'clock this morning. You, you went over there to a store and witnessed a lady and left her a track, and she asked me to save her. Uh, you went over there and talked to those people, and they rejected and walked away from you, but you did it anyway, and you kept doing it. And that's the thing. Keep on keeping on. You've got to keep on keeping on. And look at let's look at some of the signs. David prayed in uh, uh, many prayers through psalms. Uh, there are 70 psalms that have been titled devotional. Some 70 psalms. If you learn those 70 psalms that are devotional and you did any one of those at any given time, God will accept it as worship. Uh, because they contain, among other things, precious and uh, personal promises which all believers can feed upon. These are the green pastures. David said in Psalm uh, 23, The Lord leads me in green pastures. He leads me in green pastures. Wow. Dealing with these, sometimes only a promise itself will be quoted with a comment. On other occasions, a word or so may be added. These signs include both sobering or sobbing and singing. <coughs> times of uh, uh, weeping and times of singing. And uh, the author at times uh, will he'll pout. David pouted to God in some of his psalms. He pouted and he said, Oh, oh God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why, where, where are you, Lord? I'm in, a, I'm in a strait right here. I got a bear after me. And God came up and wiped all doubt away from David that he was with him because he slew the bear. And remember, doubt. And then some of them are filled with shouts. They just shout out to you. Ah, the Lord is my shepherd. The Psalm 23 does all of the above things for you. Uh, the review in the past and the review of the future. Do you know that Psalms have past and future, past, present, and future, past, present, and future, past, present, and future. It's all there. Uh, it's not written for just that day. It's written for uh, before that day, during that day, and after that day. Uh, a naked soul of man the naked soul of man. That is a statement that needs to really be looked at. As perhaps in no other writings do you see a man bearing his soul out like you do in the Psalms and in the Proverbs, but mainly the Psalms. Psalm 4, a selection. Uh, if you want communion with God, and you want to have communion with God, he said, but know that the Lord has set apart him that is godly 
for himself. The Lord will hear when I call upon him. Psalm 4 and 3. That is a blessed, blessed thing to look at. To see that God will hear <coughs> an old guy who was an old sinner for 30 years following the devil doing everything the devil would do and then God said hey you've gone as far as you can go I'm taking you in under my wing and you ain't going that way no more and that was on November 5th 1972 at 3 o'clock in the morning God took this man right here out of a liquor bottle and changed his ways he said I will both lay me down in peace wow I lay down in peace every night I lay down in peace and sleep <laughs> and I get to sleep but thou Lord only makest me dwell in safety verse chapter 4 and verse 8 this is a reflection on the man that follows God if you follow God he will make you lay down in peace and, and here David's praying brought him peace and it brought him sleep. One of the sweetest fringe benefits of Christian life is peace. That's the, listen. I'm, I'm a man, you're looking at a man right here who's been married 54 years and my wife has terminal cancer. She's fixing to leave me this year, probably before the year's over. And, and I'm having to have peace in my heart. I'm having to have peace knowing that we're gonna meet at those gates in heaven when I come up there. She's gonna uh, exceed me. I'm gonna really have to be, uh, watch my P's and Q's. I'm gonna have to be a careful man. When my, my wife gets up there looking down, she, <laughs> she's gonna say, hey, don't turn that television on now, open that Bible. Hey, don't get up there, don't stay up late watching that TV. Go to bed early so you can get out early and do some Bible study and do some preaching and teaching on the YouTube and do some things. The Lord will bless his people with peace. Psalm 29 and verse 11. What an awesome, I've got, I write in my Bibles, what an awesome place to be. What an awesome place to be where there's peace. Boy, great peace. Not just peace, but great peace. God said, I give you great peace. Those which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Psalm 119, 165. And I have a big old wow with an explanation point behind that. That's something. See, I'm going over stuff that I've already studied. Stuff that I already have in my heart. Stuff that I've already learned. I'm passing on to you, whoever you are watching, that this can be had. Even after 30 years of living for the devil, you can have this. You can have... Do you know where I got my, my peace? Was passing out from drinking in the bottle uh, for 15 years. But drink and pass out. And I woke up in misery. I didn't have any peace. There was no peace in my life. That's why I drank, trying to find peace. But you can't find peace in the world. You can't find peace in the bottle. You can't find peace anywhere but in this book. Right here. God's holy word is the only place you can find peace. And I'm going to tell you this. You're not going to like it. <clears throat> Some of you who are Christians, who are in liberal churches, who use a liberal book, something other than the King James Version, you're probably going to turn me off. And you're not going to like it. But I'm going to tell you, the only Bible that I have found this peace in is this King James Version. I find other paraphrases have taken the peace out of the book, changed the name, changed the word to something else. And you can't do that. You can't do that. Peace is peace. It's one word that can't be changed. The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. 
chapter up to 19 and verse 7 chapter 9 and verse 17 this is where America is standing with a hand on the doorknob right now of completely shutting God out they're fixing to slam the door and say no more God for us we're going to be the way Christians they're going to be closing church doors they're going to be running preachers off they're not going to want to hear anything that is against what they want to do. And they want to do, what they want to do is opposite from God. But when God comes on the scene, He brings conviction. And people don't like conviction. They don't want to be convicted. They want to live in their sin without conviction. Well, one day, they will live in hell forever under the reality that they could have ask God to save them, forgive them of their sin, and got a new life. Psalm 11 and 6. And then we go to several verses in the New Testament. We're not going there right now. Psalm 13. Select, how long will thou forget me, O Lord? Forever? How long will I hide thy face from me? Verse 1. What happened? David got, for a few minutes, got separated in his own mind from God. God didn't leave David. David got out of whack with following God. And then he says, how long, Lord, I tell you what I can do. You let me sit and watch a TV program for an hour, an hour and a half. It might not even be a bad one. No cussing it, no nothing. It might be a western. It might be something not even really bad to watch. But I will get convicted about wasting that time that I could have spent either doing something for the Lord, in the Lord, or with the Lord, or doing some, some of this beautiful study right here. Some of this stuff that fills your heart with, with wonderful things. And it doesn't make you feel forlorn after doing it for an hour or so. It doesn't make you feel like you just wasted some time like it does when you're watching TV. You say, is it wrong to watch TV, Brother Peter? And for some people, it may not be because they're not doing anything anyway. But for those who are doing something, who are following the Lord, yes, it robs you of time that you should be. How should we take counsel in my soul? Having sorrow in my heart daily. How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? David was in a a straight right here when he wrote this sign. He had enemies chasing him. He was running. He was hiding. He was doing things. He lived in a different world than we live in today. But I want you to know this. We've got the same exact thing David had. The world is running, chasing us off. I have many neighbors around me. I try my best to get my neighbors to come to the church or to ask Jesus to forgive them of their sin, come in the heart and save the soul. Many of them I talk to say, well, I'm already saved. Well, I'm saved. Well, they say they're saved, but they've never come into a church. They've never sat under the Word of God. They've never listened, really listened to what God said, do and don't do. A saved person doesn't do the way of the world continually and be saved. They're not saved. They're fooling themselves. They went to church at some time. They've got churchianity, and they're following churchianity. A saved person follows God, follows God. And that's what we need to do. We need to follow God. It said, uh, one properly held misconception about the Bible is, is that its heroes were men who differed entirely from other men. That's not true. That's a misconception. The men that God used in the Bible were just exactly like you and me. What did they do different? They yielded their self to God. Some of them never, seemingly it looked like they suffered defeat. But they did. Uh, they never became discouraged, but they did. They were at all times successful, but they weren't. Uh, yet they were still God's people. They were saintly people. 
and I had things happen to them. Uh, they were uh, supremely happy, yes, but they also had uh, times of unhappiness or, or times of forlornness. There was absolutely nothing further removed from the truth that says that a man that gets saved and follows God will never have any more trouble. On the contrary, when you get saved, you take the devil on as your foe. He is your enemy. And he is a wise enemy. He is a deceitful enemy. He is an enemy that can uh, sneak in at times when you would never think he could. And here he is. He's lurking in every corner. He's, he's in the cracks of every floor. He's in the corners of everywhere. He's everywhere to be seen. He is watching. The fact is that all of those men that are written in this Bible was subject to all the passions as we are. James 5.17 says that. That we are under all of those things that all men are under. These men had all borne the bitter burden of defeat on many occasions. They were at times overwhelmed with despair as sons and daughters of Adam are today. Don't you think <laughs> God's man, uh, Jonah, got a little bit forlorn down there in that belly of that whale down in the bottom of the sea when he said, I have entered into the gates of hell and I'm forlorn. And he got down there, but boy, he prayed about it. And God took him out of there. Disobedience put him there. Despondency of a, of a human being sometimes comes even after in, in their prayer. God, I'm just despondent. God, I have, man, Lord, I have, I got it piled on me. And, and, and the Lord said, hey, wait a minute. Nothing's piled on you compared to what got piled on me. And I bore it all. They snatched my beard out. They spit on me. Yet I had the power to drop all of them dead if I wanted to, but didn't do it. I could have called 10,000 legions of angels. That was billions, not just millions. To come and wipe the whole place out. But I didn't do it. I went to the cross for you. Psalm 13 is such an example of soul suffering, supplication, and other noble examples are as follows. David's prayer in Psalm 6, 1 through 7. I want to read that. In Psalm 6, 1 through 7. He said, O Lord, rebuke me not in thine anger, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. David knew that God had a side that was angry when it needed to be. What kind of anger? The kind of anger that says to a child, Child, I told you not to touch that thing on that table. Now I'm going to politely and decently and gently whip you with a belt. I'm going to give you three stripes because you put your hand on something on that table I told you not to. That is polite anger. God has polite anger when he's angry at you. He lets you know that you are under a direct uh, uh, statement of do not do that or do not touch that thing or do not go there. And, and this is what he said. Rebuke me not in thine anger, neither chasten me in thy heart displeasure. Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am weak, O Lord. Heal me, for my bones are vexed. David had got to a place when he wrote this sign that even his bones bothered him, hurt him. He was hurting because he was had 
been through some disobedience and some trouble. And not always disobedience or trouble. You can have trouble that's not disobedience and your bones can hurt. He said, My soul is also so vexed, but thou, O Lord, how long? Return, O Lord, deliver my soul. O save me for thy mercy's sake. I tell you what, there's no harder place for a man to get than his self-pity. Pitying his self for something. Do you know the only way out of that is take your foot, raise it backwards just as high as you can, kick yourself in the butt, and get moving. And forget about where you are, where you've been, or what you're doing, and say, God, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to get up. I'm going to say a prayer or two. I'm going to get in my Bible. And I want you to uh, keep me. God will keep you. If, uh, those whose mind is stayed upon thee, he will keep in perfect peace. If you have your mind stayed on God, you can be in perfect peace. For in death there is no remembrance of thee. In the grave who shall give thee thanks? He said, while you're on this earth. David's saying, while you're on this earth, you better do what you can do. You better uh, proceed and get things done that you need to get done while you're here. Otherwise, you're going to enter glory, if you're going to glory, with nothing, no rewards. I this 1,500 miles square and high of the city, New Jerusalem. Are you going to be in it? What kind of place are you going to have in it? What kind of, what kind of rewards are you going to have when you get to heaven? There's going to be those with many. There's going to be those. Do you know that you can get as many as seven crowns? The Bible talks very plainly about five of those crowns. But there's a couple more that you can get. And uh, he said, I'm weary with my groaning. Listen to this. All the night make I my bed swim. In other words, he's weeping all night long. I water my couch with my tears. Mine eyes is consumed because of grief. It waxed old because of all mine enemies. Now all the enemies of David were not just human. The enemies of David were things that he allowed himself to do in life. And they became his enemy. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. For the Lord hath heard the voice of my weeping. The Lord hath heard my supplication. The Lord will receive my prayer. Let all mine enemies be ashamed and so vexed. Let them return and be ashamed suddenly. I got news for you. The enemy here that David had did not have to change one bit. Who had to change was David. He had to change his attitude toward that enemy. And when he did, the enemy went away. Uh, when he started praying for them instead of against them, saying, God, deliver those people under thy hand. And God, make, make them want you as I want you. It said, and then once he started praying for his enemy, it took away the reproach he had from his enemy, and he didn't see them the same way. And by seeing them different, he was able to act different and handle the whole situation different. Do you know most, most of my people that I would say was an enemy to me any time since I've been saved was a figment of my imagination, the most of it? was a figment of my imagination. That's what it was. It wasn't so much that person. You see, the devil is a devil of illusion. He makes things allude to you that aren't really true. Somebody may say something off the wall and not mean one single solitary thing derogatory about it, and you take it the wrong way, and you feel it was derogatory towards you. So be careful. 
Be careful. And go, go on to, from 6 to chapter 7 in Psalms. It said, O Lord my God, in thee do I put my trust. Save me from all them that persecute me and deliver me. <laughs> How's God going to save him from those that persecute him? By freeing him from feeling persecuted. From feeling that. God was persecuted. Jesus was persecuted. He went to the cross. And you know what he said? He said, Lord, forgive them for they know not what they do. You and I have the same exact prayer to pray. Do you know people that cuss us because we're Christians? They don't know what they're doing. They don't understand that the devil's using them to whip on a, a man that is godly and following God. Look at verse 2. Lest he tear my soul like a lion, rending it in pieces, while there is none to deliver. Listen. A man doesn't get forlorn in the body. He gets forlorn in the soul. And when he gets full on in the soul, then his body takes on that characteristic. You can get sick. And there are many people that are full on in the soul and they're sick in the body. So we need to be careful of that. He said, oh Lord, my God, wow. Verse 3, if I have done this, if there be iniquity in my hands, <laughs> God's showing him. There's no if about it, David. You had done it. And you've had some iniquity in your hands. You say, what is that for you, Brother Peter? For me, it's be watching TV. For me, it would be uh, not communing with God when I should. For me, it would be not getting up when God says, get up. It, for me, it would be when God says, turn that computer on and, and I turn it on. For me, it would be when God wakes me up and says, go down to the truck stop. It's only 24 hours a day. Pump you a couple dollars worth of gas. I'm going to send somebody there from Ohio or New Mexico or somewhere. The tag will reveal where they're from when you pull out. And they'll probably be in paying for their gas and while they are, Gives you the opportunity to get the pump in your car and then when they come out, take a track out of your pocket and pass it to them and talk to them about Jesus while they're traveling. If they've already paid and they've already put their pump up, be wise. A few words. Maybe a little prayer even. The guy says, well, I'm from uh, New Mexico and i got to go to Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, for some kind of meeting that really means a lot to me. And all you have to do is say, hey, let me have a little prayer for you while you go. And just bow your head and say a little bit of prayer. And say, okay. Look for God in this thing. Look for God. And they're gone. You'll never see them again until you get to heaven. You didn't get their name. You don't know their name. You don't know anything about them. Really. Except that they're, they're there. All right. Uh, lest he tear my soul like a lion, rend me. All right. Let's get on to five. Uh, let the enemy persecute my soul and take it. Yea, let him tear down my life upon the earth and lay mine honor in the dust. Selah. When you see that word selah, that means read that verse again and muse on it. David's crossing a bridge. We're crossing bridges every single hour of the day. During the minutes of the day, we're crossing bridges. Now David just crossed a bridge that said, Okay, God, you let them say anything they want to me, about me. You let them persecute my soul. You let them take it, yea. Let them tear down my life upon the earth. Let my honor be in the dust. And I'm going to take and follow you, God. And I'm not going to pay any attention to what they do because what they do doesn't mean a thing. 
it's all dead and harmless and it doesn't mean anything unless I take it on me and allow it to mean something. Arise, O Lord, in thine anger. Lift up thyself because of the rage of mine enemies and awake for me to the judgment that thou hast commanded. So shall the congregation of the people be compassed thee about for their sakes. Therefore return thou on high. The Lord shall judge the people. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to mine integrity that is in me. Now he's saying, God, please do me a favor. Please do not judge me for anything, my weaknesses. But please judge me for what you have given me in the integrity of the Christian life that I'm living. Would you judge me according to that? and not according to what I've just been through and forgive me for going through what I went through and taking personal all the things that were against me because I know you're in control and you can handle it and so David walked away free <laughs> free as a bird with no more problem well our time has come and gone we'll see you next time bye bye